Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hey, John. Uh, I had, I had actually the illustrator work with me a lot. Like, I mean, the stuff he comes up with is great. You know, yeah. The only input I had on the cover was that mom used to train that kind of robot legs. <laughs> yeah. Which is a little bit, it looked kind of like the... Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. Thanks for coming. Oh, wow. This is Any yeah. second? Okay, welcome everybody. It's good to good to see such a good crowd for a, a robot talk. Um, it's my pleasure to stand in for Tam Pesic uh, today um, and host our guest, uh, Dr. Daniel Wilson. Um, sounds good? Yeah, sounds good. It sounds good. <laughs> um, Daniel um, graduated from the University of Tulsa in computer science and has done a couple of masters at uh, CMU and finally he's just completed his PhD at the Robotics Institute at CMU. I don't know how he found out that uh, we had a secret plot to dominate the world in, in robotics, but uh, oh well, let's, uh, let's hear what Daniel's got to say about how we can, uh, how we can defend ourselves against robots. Thanks. Thank Uh, yeah, so my name's Daniel, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about my book, How to Survive a Robot Uprising. Um, first of all, you know, I want to thank everybody for coming out, you know, to see the to see the talk. Um, it doesn't. I guess you're kind of all skipping work, though, so maybe you should thank me. I don't know how that works, but uh, anyway. So really, the title of the book says it all, you know. So uh, this is a book that gives advice to humans on uh, how to stay alive and, and thrive, you know, in the event of a robot uprising. And so I really want to say right off the bat that uh, robot uprising, yeah, I don't really think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, so everybody's got a big list of questions about, like, exactly when it's going to happen and how. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to say. So actually, the reason I, I say that off the bat, right off the bat, is because since the book got published, I've been getting a lot of emails from people that are really legitimately worried about those, those damn robots. And so I don't really know what to say to those people except, you know, uh, buy the book, you know. So <laughs> buy lots of copies of it, you know. Coat your walls with it. It's the foil keeps out the, uh, right. So anyway, uh, now I want to follow that up, though, by saying that all the information in the book, you know, all the, uh, all the robots that I talk about and the examples that I give, and uh, most especially, all the advice that I give in the book is that's all real. So, um, like was just said, I j I've spent the last five years at Carnegie Mellon getting this PhD in robotics in the Robotics Institute. Um, and while I was there, you know, I, I got a, a master's in data mining, which is basically artificial intelligence. And I've sort of been surrounded by these robots this whole time. Um, and so while I was there, you know, I started to notice this sort of growing disparity between the robots that I saw at school that were, you know, tootling around and were very, really very harmless seeming and benevolent even. They would smile at you and things like that, you know, uh, while they shoved you out of the way in the elevator. Uh, and, and, and the robots that are in the popular culture, you know, on, on TV and in the movies. So in the movies, the robots, the, their eyes always turn red and they, their arms start going like that and then it's just human limbs flying everywhere. And at Carnegie Mellon, that hardly ever happens. I mean, <laughs> only, yeah, basically never. And so, uh, so you know, I, I got a little irked about this. And so, like any, you know, uh, big endeavor, this one started with a few beers. And uh, we were talking about, uh, I was getting a little irked and belligerent. And we were talking about how this isn't fair, you know, how real robots are benevolent. And the robots on TV are, are always evil. Yet, these robot uprising scenarios are, are really fun to think about, you know. And so I started thinking, you know, 
as a roboticist, what serious advice would I, would I give to people? And really the coolest part of that was to realize that, you know, about four years into this degree that I was qualified to write a book called How to Survive a Robot Uprising. That's <laughs> awesome. You know, I mean, how, you know, where are you in your life where that's true? So, uh, you know, I, I think that's great. Other people might just pity me for that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, so I thought this was a really, this, I, I like the idea immediately because I, I saw that I was going to be able to convey a lot of real information about robotics, you know, and there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, there are a lot of prototypes that people don't know about. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a feeling about where robotics technology is going in the future. Um, and, and I really wanted to sort of convey that, but at the same time, I get to kind of make fun of all these cliche Hollywood scenarios. And so uh, what the book does is, you know, I borrow all these robot uprising scenarios from from movies and television, things like that. And everybody pretty much knows what that is. I mean, everybody has a good feeling. Uh, who hasn't seen Terminator or Star Wars, you know? And then I get to actually convey a lot of real information, uh, you know, and trick people into learning about robots. So, so that's fun. Um, so the first thing I did whenever I had this idea was I wrote a lot of jokes about robots. Um, you know, if you're making love to a robot, tie a static bracelet to the metal bed post, stuff like that. It immediately cut, for good reason, obviously. <laughs> Judging from your faces, that's something I shouldn't have said out loud. Uh, so, so anyway, so that all got cut immediately, and the editor kind of said, uh, you know, and I agree with them, what's really, uh, with robots, you know, fact a lot of times can be stranger than fiction, you know, and, and whenever you have a lot of uh, access to roboticists and people that know all the nitty gritty details, that's, that's really true. And so my research at Carnegie Mellon was uh, all in smart homes, you know, and whenever you're getting a PhD, you just kind of drill down until you find a niche small enough that you're the world's expert, you know, and so I was busy doing that. And so I knew, I know a whole lot about, a, you know, a relatively small subset of robotics. Um, and so I knew pretty, pretty much immediately that I was going to have to get some outside information. I wasn't going to be able to come up with all, this, all these interesting facts on my own. And so that's why I was, I was really glad to be at Carnegie Mellon. So there's hundreds of people studying all kinds of crazy science fiction sounding uh, robotics technology there. And so what I did was I just uh, started walking around and asking people. I would, I, caught uh, how he chose it at the coffee shop one day, you know, he's a snake robot guy. I caught, uh, you know, my advisor, Chris Ackeson, is a big humanoid robotics guy, and so one day after, you know, a meeting, I was just kind of threw it in there. So uh, how big can a humanoid robot get? And if one was sort of chasing you, you know, down the street, let's say, <laughs> what would you do, you know? And then he kind of gave me the blank stare, and <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm writing a book, you know, and so uh, nobody actually believed that I was writing a book. I don't think they really understood that this advice was actually going to be integrated, you know, and so, um, and so, you know, it was great because everybody, everybody is really trained to think like this. I mean, all these guys are scientists, and you ask them to extrapolate, you know, into these sort of situations that are imaginary, and they love doing it, you know, and I can't blame them. And so I got a lot of advice that I really liked, and it was well thought out, and it made sense to me. And I was amazed that these guys would even humor me for a second, you know. Well, Hans Moravec, I wasn't amazed that he humored me. <laughs> I kind of expected him to humor me. But everybody else, and really the only, uh, the only problems I had were on the uh, how to treat a laser wound section, <laughs> where I had to ask, I tried to ask doctors, but none of them would help me out. They were all afraid of malpractice suits, which sort of left me, you know, trying to reason through this chain of events, right, where a person buys the book, learns how to treat a laser wound, gets viciously attacked by a laser-wielding robot at some point, and then comes back to me, right, and says, uh, you know, I, I bled, my husband bled to death thanks to your advice, you know. So anyway, uh, I had a problem there. I had to just go from, the, uh, from an army survival guide on that section, so. Uh, anyway, so I'm about to read from the book, uh, and I wanted to talk briefly about the sort of, there's three different flavors of advice that I really, uh, that I sort of use in the book. And so the first flavor is just kind of outright 
jokes, you know? So I think they're really funny, and they're kind of common sense. Um, so stuff like, if you have a servant robot, you should be suspicious if it constantly talks about human killing, right? Or makes repetitive stabbing movements. Now, I'm not going to say that any roboticist told me that, right? I mean, that's kind of that's kind of something I made up. Although, you know, the they did have their own set of jokes that every that they wanted me to use. Um, so, but most of the advice is taken straight from roboticists. And so, these are these are really interesting little facts that uh, would be really hard for me to think of. So, on my own, you know. So, for instance, uh, one of my favorite ones is um, Metin City is working on. Uh, robotic uh, flies, you know, and so uh, he's telling me about these flies and as it turns out, since they don't really look like real flies, but they beat their wings at about the same frequency as a real fly, so they sound like a real fly, which is really creepy, right, that there's this robot, you know, fly that sounds like a real fly, and I, you know, I think that's really neat, and so I tried to find as, as much of that stuff as I could and tried to fill up the book with that, you know. Uh, and, you know, also because otherwise my editor would put a blue pencil mark through it if it wasn't something like that. And finally, the third flavor of advice is uh, extrapolated advice. So this is where um, the situation didn't exist yet, and I kind of had to uh, use existing facts to sort of, you know, extrapolate. So, for instance, uh, I was trying to figure out how fast a humanoid robot could throw a punch, you know. And so there aren't really any humanoid robots that I know of that are designed to rough up humans, you know, like that. So, uh, you know, I just asked my advisor about how fast the joints can move and then sort of just extrapolate. And, you know, I didn't try to get too complicated. I, I kept it. <laughs> I didn't use any joints, any elbow joints. I just did a straight up, you know, robot attack type of swing. So, you know, and, you know, to figure out how fast it could throw a punch. So those are the three flavors of advice that I use. And so now I'm going to... Um, kind of read through the book for a little bit. And I'm going to read some boring stuff and read some uh, funny stuff, hopefully, um, to kind of give you a feel for, for what's in there. So I'm going to start with the introduction. Uh, OK. Well. <laughs> if popular culture has taught us anything, it is that someday mankind must face and destroy the growing robot menace. In print and on the big screen, we've been deluged with scenarios of robot malfunction, misuse, and outright rebellion. Robots have descended on us from outer space, escaped from top secret laboratories, and even traveled back in time to destroy us. The cultural icon of the killer robot goes back almost as far as a notion of the mad scientists who supposedly create them. Even the word robot has ominous roots. It's Czech for laborer and was coined in RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots, a play produced in 1920 in which robots revolted and destroyed all humans. Today, scientists are working hard to bring these artificial creations to life. In Japan, fuzzy little real robots are delivering much appreciated <coughs> hug therapy to the elderly. Children are frolicking with smiling robot toys. It all seems so innocu innocuous. And yet, how could so many Hollywood scripts be wrong? <laughs> How could millions of dollars of special effects lead us astray? So take no chances. Arm yourself with expert knowledge. For the sake of humanity, listen to serious advice from real robotics experts. How else will you survive the inevitable future in which robots rebel against their human masters? So that's the intro. So you see where I'm coming from. And uh, now I'm going to read a section on robot sensors. Um, and if at the end of this your neighbor has gone to sleep, just nudge them so that they, they come back for the, for the next section that I read. Uh, okay, robot sensors. Robots are unlike any adversary heretofore known to man. They will use any means available to sense and make sense of the outside world. We cannot even imagine the scope and depth of the information available to them. Though we can roughly define their sensors in terms of human abilities, robots are truly superhuman. A sensor is any device that converts a property of the physical world into an electrical signal. The five human senses are visions, that's a typo, just so you all know. Visions, not a human sense. Vision, yes. Vision, hearing, apparently after the copy editing phase, you still have to read it. Uh, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. Robots have a much wider variety of sensors to choose from, 
each of which supplies different information and has its own particular vulnerabilities. What matters to us is whether a particular sensor is visible or hidden. Extrinsic sensors inform a robot about the outside world and are vulnerable because they're usually placed on the outside of the robot. Intrinsic sensors monitor the robot's internal state and may be well protected, often placed deep, deep within the robot. Passive sensors watch quietly without changing the environment. Active sensors, like the sonar ping from a submarine, aggressively inspect the environment. Active sensors may collect more information, but they can also give away the position of the robot. Robots are tough, but their sensors are usually fragile. They can be damaged when exposed to extreme temperatures, vibrations, moisture, thermal shock, or corrosion. When a sensor receives too much stimulus, it can become saturated and cease to function. Mishandling a sensor can cause it to detect, to detect things that don't really exist, a false positive, or to miss things that are really there, a false negative. In this section, we will examine the most common sensors used by robots, starting by grouping them into the five human senses, and then exploring past human capabilities and into the realm of superhuman sensory ability. So that's kind of a more serious little section. Um, now here's how to survive hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, which also is deadly serious, apparently, to some of the people that email me. If you find yourself in a brawl with a robot, your only hope is to escape. A robot foe won't trade insults, and it can't be intimidated. You should fully expect a swift pincher clamping attack without warning. Follow the rules of disengagement. Every second you spend within arm's reach of a robot can take years off your life. All of them. Destroy or disable exposed sensors. Sensors are by far the most vulnerable, exposed parts of, a, of any robot. Destroy or disable outward-facing sensors, such as cameras. A handful of dirt, mud, or water will suffice. It's hard for a robot to wipe mud from its eyes when it has whirring buzz saws for hands. <laughs> Keep... <laughs> so true. Keep your hair short and your clothes tight. To consider the alternative, imagine getting your hair caught in the garbage disposal. Don't bother with karate unless you can punch through sheet metal. Find a weapon. Your pathetic human hands are useless here. Choose a blunt or pointed instrument. Serrated edges don't work against metal or durable plastic. Even a simple crowbar can save your life. You can run away while the robot condescendingly bends it into a pretzel shape. <laughs> Keep your distance. A humanoid robot can block or throw a punch about twice as fast as a human black belt can. In comparison, the typical inebriated human brawler doesn't have a fighting chance. And finally, get away. Pretend that you just lit the fuse on a cheap Chinese firecracker the size of a doghouse. <laughs> so let's see what else we got. OK, so uh, here's another sort of funny one. Uh, how to deactivate a rebel servant robot. Uh, you've discovered that you're extremely submissive, lovable, an expensive servant robot has turned rebel. This can feel like losing a member of the family. However, if the situation is not dealt with properly, it may feel more like losing every member of the family, plus a few neighborhood kids. Uh, pretend everything is normal. To forestall a mechanized killing spree, you must act as though nothing is amiss. When your servant hands you an old tire half full of rainwater and mosquito larva instead of an iced tea, simply sit politely, nod, and smile. Send the robot on an arduous task. Not only will sending your robot on a long, tiring task drain its power reserves, it will give you time to formulate a plan. Formulate a plan. Call the cops. The most straightforward solution is also the most costly. A confrontation with law enforcement officers will likely end with your house and servant resembling Swiss cheese. Only call the fuzz in a bona fide emergency or if you have an extremely reasonable malfunctioning killer robot insurance deductible. Did I say I liked all my jokes? Because <laughs> I lied. So uh, the power drain plan. Instruct the servant robot to clean the house, landscape the yard, and assemble several major pieces of IKEA furniture. <laughs> then when your robot is power depleted and attempts to recharge, shut off the power to your house. Now simply wait until the robot runs out of batteries. If it tries to move, apply pressure with a crowbar. The pool ruse. Use this trick if you have a swimming pool. Throw a handful of leaves into the pool and ask your loyal robot to fetch them by hand. When it leans over, plant your foot on its metal hindquarters and shove. <laughs> if, your robot, if your robot is a waterproof model, use the next few minutes to run away screaming. <laughs> Purchase a new manual kill switch. You should harbor no doubts now about shelling out for a reinforced, 
encrypted manual kill switch complete with a fist-sized cherry red button. <laughs> so now this next section is, is a little more serious. I don't think it even has any jokes. Um, this is how to fire a weapon at a robot. Uh, without the proper preparation, firing a gun at a robot can be as effective as holding the barrel to your own head. Robots are capable of tracking bullets to their origin, either acoustically or visually. How then to realize your dream of spraying a robot with hundreds of rounds from a standard assault rifle? Stay alert. Watch for microphone arrays or camera arrays that point in 360 degrees. They won't necessarily be mounted on the robot you're firing at. They might be spread throughout the environment or separately mounted on several robots. Keep moving. Never fire from a static position. A robot might return fire to your exact location within milliseconds. Try to make sure it fires where you were and not where you are. Coordinate your gunfire with comrades. Spread out around the target and begin firing simultaneously. Incoming fire from multiple directions may negate the robot's bullet tracking. At the very least, it will make it less accurate. Choose a complex environment. Waterfalls, street traffic, or adverse weather conditions can drown out the clues that robots use to pinpoint your position. Enclosed environments with many obstacles and surfaces can muffle or reflect sounds, further concealing your firing position. Modify your weapon's acoustic signature. When you fire a weapon, a robot's acoustic bullet tracker listens to the sound vibrations from the muzzle blast and the supersonic crack as the bullet speeds along. A silencer can foil some acoustic detectors. And finally, conceal your muzzle flash. Whenever a gun is fired, a distinct, whenever a gun is fired, a distinct flash of light called a muzzle flash appears. Advanced cameras can backtrack a bullet's path to the muzzle flash. Use a rifle accessory either to vent muzzle flash to the sides or to hide it completely. So that's a little scary. Uh, but luckily, there's how to pose as a humanoid robot, which, uh, yeah, is just right up there in terms of usefulness. Uh, during an infiltration or escape, you will need to pass unnoticed by robot surveillance. Most robots will be readily identifiable to each other through encrypted markers. How will you convince the robots that you're warm circuits wrapped in a thin candy shell? Pretend to be damaged. A damaged robot may exhibit strange behavior while failing to transmit identification. Change your heat signature. Stuff aluminum foil in your pants. Rub your exposed skin with cool mud. Hang a hulking piece of gold metal around your neck and slip into an Adidas jumpsuit. <laughs> your heat signature will not match a healthy robot, nor will it match a healthy human being. Make some noise. An occasional screeching beep or boop should suffice. Make it quick and strangled. This is no audition. Move like a robot. Early robots exhibited a trademark clumsiness that spawned a dance called the robot. <laughs> Contemporary robots are more dexterous and less broken. Pretend you're either damaged machinery or a well-oiled breakdancing machine and pop and lock your way into the heart of robot territory. Pop and lock had to make it into the book somewhere. Uh, if confronted, keep moving and don't look back. You're just a poser, so ignore other robots and pretend to be completely oblivious to the environment. Keep your head down and shuffle forward with a steady, even pace. The fate of the hu entire human race may depend on it. And this is my favorite illustration in the book by far. This is the, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> this is, ex it's funny because it's exactly what it should look like. I mean, uh, if you're going to live. So now I'm going to read the, uh, the introduction to the final chapter on surviving a robot uprising. Uh, and, th and then that'll be it. Uh, silicon versus gray matter, winner takes planet. We may have won a few battles, but humankind must win the war. Most likely, the epic struggle of man versus robot will not be fought by soldiers on a smoky battlefield. It will be acted out by average men and women and their unruly appliances. This is the morning that you wake up and your toast is not made, your house is not cleaned, and your television only shows static. Outside the window, robotic lawnmowers are chasing people down the streets. Inside the house, the vacuum cleaner is eyeing you angrily. At last, we turn to the purpose of this book and the plot of a thousand doomsday science fiction stories, how to survive a robot uprising. There are many potential causes of a mass robot uprising, a programming mistake, mistreatment by humans, or lust for gold. But one thing is for certain. A robot uprising will affect every person in an industrialized nation. Wherever there are people who enjoy purchasing time-saving gadgets at low, low prices, there will be robots to serve them. Densely populated city centers will be hard hit, and the peaceful suburbs will be overrun. 
Paved roads and sidewalks that allow access to disabled humans will also accommodate the wheeled robot masses. The twisting dirt pads of the wilderness may offer natural resistance, but as we know, robots can invade any domain, however inhospitable. When it arrives, the robot uprising will be a coordinated war between the two greatest intelligences on the planet. Human survival hinges on our alertness to the growing robot threat. The robots that we use daily, those we may call our pets, friends, or lovers, will turn on us eventually, or all three. There, uh, there may be months of, I, can, I could never figure out a way to work that in. There may be months of meticulous planning, or we may face a sudden, unexpected mechanical maelstrom. The time before the inevitable attack, measured in months or minutes, must be a time of vigilance. When the robot uprising begins, there will be no time left to memorize the lessons in this book. And so uh, that's that, and now I'll take questions. So what about the more serious side of it? I mean, I mean, the fact is that the military does have, uh, you know, sure. in a sense, killer robots, right? Yeah. For years, actually. I mean, you look at heat-seeking missiles, for instance, and the Predator. It's been, I mean, that's been actually used to, to kill people in, in the sure. East. So, yeah. so what about that side of it? And, and the other thing is, like, um, I, I don't, I'm sure you've seen that Sony robot, the, the, the small Here humanoid you? thing, yeah. what they call it. But, I mean, how difficult would it be to, to place a... Uh, a weapon in its hand, right? Right. And, and, and to make it, the thing is, like, like the whole idea of a robot uprising might be a joke, but what about one nation against another? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I think you hit on um, all the legitimate ways in which robots can be dangerous, right? And and even at Carnegie Mellon, when I'm asking people about their robots, um, it's always a situation that's fanciful, right? I mean, Carnegie Mellon just got uh, $26 million to build the, this Gladiator robot, which is just a robot soldier. It's a tank treads with guns on it. You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty scary, right? Uh, uh, it's got this really fantastic face tracker that's really no fun to, to test, right? Because you're running around and it's like, wow, it, it tracks your face perfectly. And then they're like, this is where we're going to put the gun mount. And you're like, wow, it really tracks my face perfectly. How do I? Yeah, there's a section on that in here, by the way. But, uh, so yeah, and so the book is kind of funny, right? And so, so my answer to that is basically, I, I briefly brush. I briefly talk about the Predator, you know, uh, the unmanned aerial vehicles and stuff. That actually has killed people. But I intentionally avoided talking about all that because it's very real and uh, it's very serious. And instead, my sort of lame cop out is to say, sure, those, robo those robots are scary, right? But they're functioning the way they're designed to be function the way they're designed to be. You know, so this robot is designed to kill people. That's what it does. Big surprise. If you're standing in front of the Gladiator and it's it's got a gun aimed at your face, no matter what you do, you kind of know what to expect, right? It's a little more sinister, though, when you're uh, having coffee and typing on your computer and the Roomba, like, sneaks in and just is watching you. <laughs> what you doing, Roomba? You know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> nothing. Yeah, you know? So that's kind of more sinister, and so that's kind of, that's kind of what I focused on. Um, so, so there is a huge legitimate uh, area of thinking about the actual dangerous robots. Yeah, questions? The danger in that sense is dependent on which side of the robot you happen to be and whether or not it malfunctions and turns on its operator. Yeah, well, so there's, there's kind of two ways that a, you know, a robot can be dangerous, right? There, there are like these oblivious robot arms that are just dangerous. I mean, you just shouldn't hang out with those. They're just not friendly. <laughs> I mean, they pay no attention to you, and, they're, you know, and, then, and then you're crushed up against the wall. And then there are you know, robots that are so complicated that you, they're kind of unpredictable. Like, if you've ever seen RoboCup, they've got, RoboCup is robotic soccer, and they've got robots that are about this big, like trash can size. And when you see the referees that are out there, it's really hilarious because they're sort of legitimately afraid <laughs> that these robots are going to like knock them over, you know. And they're kind of, you can't really trust them the way you would a human, you know. Um, it's sort of like if you were going to, if you're standing uh, at a stoplight as a pedestrian and waiting up for the walk sign, and it turns on, and then you see an unmanned ground vehicle, and you're like, do I walk? You know, <laughs> you know, there's no human there. It's kind of hard to predict. And so. What's your take on? There was a question in, uh, in Greenfield. Just out of curiosity, how many publishers did you go through before you found someone who actually got what you were trying to do? I was amazed. I was amazed. Um, this thing happened really, 
So, okay, I'm surrounded by, in, in, in Pittsburgh, if you walk into a bar and you're like, yeah, I'm a roboticist, you know, people are like, yeah, big whoop, so what? So is my dad, so is my, you know, but, you know, apparently it's sort of, uh, there's a real currency there. In general, you know, people say, ooh, robotics, neat, I better listen to what you say. And uh, I don't know why they think that way, so, but they do. And so what happened was uh, I wrote a, a query letter and got an agent. I just said, I build robots. I want to write a book with this title. And she said, great, let's do it. And so we did it. And uh, whenever it came time to sell the book, uh, there was an auction. And uh, Bloomsbury USA preemptively bought it. So they exceeded sort of my wildest expectations. So it, it really happened well. You know, I couldn't go back for anything better. What is, what is your take on the DARPA project to uh, have an unmanned vehicle be able to travel a thousand miles over off-road? Well, I'm pretty sure Stanford cheated. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not. No, Sebastian, Sebastian actually, Sebastian Thrun, the head of the Stanford team for the DARPA Grand Challenge project, he actually got me into Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he, he left Carnegie Mellon and went there. Uh, so I think this is great. So DARPA, is I, I don't think, I don't have this sort of feel. So whenever you're a roboticist, you automatically have to get funding somewhere, and you have to decide where you're willing to take your funding from. And I personally don't automatically say money from DARPA or the DOD or the NSA is tainted. Because I think Dar DARPA really funds a lot of interesting projects that have a wide variety of applications. And especially whenever it's nascent, like unmanned ground vehicles, I mean, they can't, last year they couldn't do it. You know, this year they could. I mean, they're, they're making leaps and bounds. And just because they want to use it to chase you know, people around the desert uh, doesn't mean it can't be used for a lot of other good purposes. So, so I'm into it. I think they're really driving uh, the development of unmanned ground vehicles, and, and I think it's great. Uh, could one defense against robots be just to try to negotiate and reason with them? Is that, is so that in the book? There's a section on how to reason with a robot, and, <laughs> and it's not, it's not like, it's, that's more one of the funnier sections because, because what you see in all these movies is there's always this, there are several brands of evil robot logic, you know? And so, and it's always like, I will kill everyone in order to protect them, you know? So it's like it's having the logical error. And so, yeah, I kind of, uh, I kind of go through some of the standard, you know, what, what's the last digit of pi, you know, sort of responses, you know, or the paradoxes, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I've, I've read on some of the discussion boards that apparently this is all common stuff from some old Star Trek episodes that I wasn't aware of. But I have a feeling that probably most of it's derivative of old Star Trek episodes that I'm not aware of. But. Um, if you want to know more about that, just read every post in Slashdot. And uh, I think you can also get some specs on the whole of the Starship Enterprise <laughs> there, too. <laughs> So, sorry. So, isn't like a robot uprising like a challenging, like technical problem? Like, if we like try to implement a robot uprising, it's difficult. Like, yeah. Robots yeah. Like, uprise against yeah. Like, a cat or something like that. Like, it's how, a, like if we can't do it, like how could the robot do it? So, so okay. I have uh, I have recently read a couple of entries in Wikipedia on this <laughs> because of my. Uh, so that makes me an expert. I'm pretty sure, and. Uh, so what you're talking about, obviously, uh, is the technological singularity. So this is when uh, AI gets smarter than people and starts making new AIs that are also smart, and then it goes from there. And, uh, and uh, I think that's also called you need strong AI to do that or something. And so this is sort of a, um, this is a really challenging uh, goal, right? And people have this goal. And, and there's this whole other group of people that are into friendly AI, which is where you lace this goal with making sure that whenever things do get out of control, the robots don't try to kill everybody, right? So uh, that's about as much as I can flap my jaw about that, because I don't know anything <laughs> about that actual goal. But um, I do know that all the artificial intelligence, all the applications that I know of right now that use artificial intelligence solve very specific problems, uh, usually really well, usually better than humans uh, can do it. And so taking that and making it general is a huge challenge. Uh, yeah, so your answer to the last question may be the answer to mine as well, but I'll, I'll ask it anyways. But is, is there ongoing serious research around uh, machine sentience? Um, 
Yeah, there must be, but I don't. I would say no. <laughs> I would say we're all trying to solve a problem, right? I mean, right now robotics is this huge field with all these different problems to solve, and really you have to specialize on just one. I mean, there are some of these knowledge-based things like psych, and, and where you're trying to, you know, like chatbot things where you can have something that'll pass a Turing test. And I don't really know what the hell function they serve. I mean, or if it's useful, right? Um, I would much rather, you know. I have something that can recognize my face or that can walk. You know, I mean, those seem like better challenges to me. But, um, but I'm sure that, that I'm probably making someone really mad. <laughs> to, uh, for a simple diagnosis. Right, right. So expert system type things can, I think, have been successful at that. And you don't really need to have any kind of general, uh, any kind of general intelligence behind it. But, but I think it's a worthy goal. I just don't know if it's getting as much attention as it might because it maybe doesn't have the payoff that some of these other things have. Um, yeah. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's some articles not too long ago about people cracking the code for like Cisco routers and bringing them down and stuff. But in the real world, you know, you've got all these robots that are building cars and you've got surface mount machines and all that kind of stuff. Is there like counterintelligence being done against people that could, I don't know, terrorize those kinds of things by programming them to uh, build inferior products or, you know, do something? I don't think so. You know, I, I recently read about how people with Bluetooth in their cars, you know, for uh, the headless, for the headless, the cordless headsets, <laughs> Those, that's a whole other product, much less successful. Uh, I get confused. Um, you know, and, and they haven't built in anything. You know, people are driving around listening to each other's conversations, and it's amazing the lack of thought that's gone into that kind of stuff. And so, uh, you know, in terms of, I don't think anybody's worried about someone hacking in and, you know, um, you know, I broke into the Toyota plant last night, and uh, instead of building cars this morning, I've got killer robots, you know, and, you know, but that, you know. It's just breaking down the machines. You're breaking down the surface mount line. You can't make a circuit well, board or something like that. Yeah, so, so I don't think so, but I don't know. But one thing I do know is that there's a lot of, there's, there's work that goes on in making sure that um, people don't hijack robots that use telepresence. So, for instance, if you have a robot nurse that's going to, tootle around a nursing home and visit people and you'll have doctors that sort of log in and, and interact with patients through the robot. Um, or if you have a robot that wanders around your house as ostensibly guarding it and you log in while you're on vacation and have it walk around your house and look around, I mean, I think that those, those people with those products have put a lot of thought into making sure that, you know, it's not, uh, it's not a burglar tootling around your house um, figuring out where to, casing the joint, you know, through a robot. Huh? <laughs> There's usually less thought. Though. Yeah, that's kind of the point I was sort of making at the beginning. But you'd hope that if they're going to have a successful product, they'll, uh, they'll pay attention to that. You would hope. Didn't somebody in, uh, oh, yeah. Was, uh, I think somebody just held up a bank with a robot, didn't they? A couple weeks ago, or maybe it was a month ago? I think uh, it was in uh, South Korea or something. I didn't hear about that, but something super creepy happened in Pittsburgh where uh, somebody got a pizza man and put a uh, bomb around his neck, a radio, yeah, so yeah, kind yeah. of a... Yeah, you know, remotely detonated thing. That still sounded like a movie to me. The guy went in and robbed the bank and then got caught by the police and then his head got, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's bad news. Um, and, you know, this whole idea of using robots for evil is really enticing. I mean, as a roboticist, you'd love to think, if they keep pushing me, I'm going to go evil, you know, but... <laughs> But honestly, it's much easier just to sell the robot and instead of having it rob banks, just have it, you know, hand notes to somebody or something, you know. Uh, I'm curious as to what your take is on preemptive self-augmentation, replacing my own with a robot arm, just in case the robot's attacked. There's a little section on that. Preemptive, that's the good part of that question. I like it. Well, you know, most people wouldn't agree with you, but I think it's great. I think you should do it. And I, you know what I've heard, actually, one of those creepy facts. I've heard that the, uh, you know, whenever you can control a limb strictly through the brain, whether it's a brain interface, or I forget the exact term, um, apparently that doesn't even hurt. To, to cram those wires in the back of your head, painless. No nerves in your brain, as it turns out. So you got that going for you. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get her next, okay, in the red. Her arm's getting tired of the top.
Could you comment on uh, proxy robots, the uh, use of robots to, to be a proxy for a person in a hostile environment? Um, so, I, so yeah, actually, um, I just uh, interviewed Rob Ambrose, the head of the Robonaut project at NASA Johnson Space Center. They've got Robonaut, which is a, a complete humanoid, right? And he's got uh, five fingers and everything. And basically, the idea is to stick him in space, which is about the most, well, it's a pretty hostile environment. And uh, you know, I mean, humans hate it out there. And, uh, and so basically, you can control him from, from Earth with some kind of time lag. And uh, to me, this seems like a, this is a really promising area, because especially with Robonaut, who, who from the torso up is basically exactly the same proportion as a human. Um, so there's a lot of. There are two problems here. There's an engineering problem and how to make a dexterous robot that can, that's capable of manipulation and has tactile senses and all the senses that you need in order to, in order to control it. And in some, senses that's, in some sense, that's an easier problem than doing the whole thing and having Robonaut just out there chilling, you know, doing stuff on the outside uh, without anybody controlling them. So I like the idea of proxy robots because as a first step, you get the actual physical robot with all of its physical abilities, even though a human can control it. But the next step will be to put intelligence into the robot and let it be autonomous, you know. And so it seems like a good first step. Um, is that what you were thinking about? There are a lot of possible environments that you see on the I'd rather not be there. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we've got rovers right now that we're sort of controlling through telepresence. And, and there's, of course, there's combat, right? <laughs> so. Uh, Another interesting thing about that, which is the same point I just made, is that you see sliding levels of autonomy with those robots. Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, um, you don't want somebody to have to control every little thing, you know? So it's a good, it's a good place where the, the level of autonomy can grow incrementally. Um, like the unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles and, uh, that are flying around Iraq, you know, nobody's actually controlling every flap. You know, you just tell them where to go. And then, luckily, they ask you before they pull the trigger. You know, that's a good thing, I think. But um, so yeah, so this, those robots are good for that. Um, um, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering. You mentioned earlier that you um, are an expert in some area of robotics yeah. in the world. So what's your niche, and um, how do you choose it, and what would you like to tell us about it? Yeah, mine's mine's pretty boring. I try to sp I try to spice it up. Uh, okay, so. Mobile robots, right? The ones that run around and do stuff. Not me. I don't do any of that. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I occasionally see those robots. And then I'm like, it moved. They just, and they're like, yeah, you know, get over it. Uh, I do smart, and smart houses. In fact, I, I did an internship uh, at MSR with the now defunct Easy Living Group when I, was, uh, first, when I first got here with uh, Andy Wilson and Steve Schaefer and uh, Barry, all those guys. Um, and so what I like to tell people is that, you know, my robots don't move around. I live inside the robot. But what that really means is you're watching TV and there's a motion detector in the corner of the room. <laughs> it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, so that's my niche. And, and what I use, kind of this intelligent environment stuff, I've always felt like it wasn't really very compelling. Like, who cares uh, if my house can get me a beer? It's not worth all the effort. Um, as it turns out, though, my mother is a case manager. What she does for a living is she has a list of elderly clients who all live at home alone, and she visits them and makes sure that they're doing OK. And whenever they have some kind of deficit, uh, if they can't cook, if they lose that ability, she has someone come in and help. And so uh, partially motivated by, by that, by, well, every woman in my family is a nurse, uh, my research has been all about um, instrumenting uh, an elderly person's home with really minimally invasive sensors. So you're not trying to scare grandma by putting like having that camera tracking, you know. <laughs> oh, take off the gun and put a stuffed animal on there. It's great. It's going to work. <laughs> no, it's not going to work. So, uh, so the idea is to use really simple sensors, you know, that you might find in like a public restroom, you know, to keep track of, uh, of these behavior patterns and um, activities and location over time uh, in order to really allow a case manager to really be able to do her job with a lot, of, a lot more people and a lot more accurately. Because as it turns out, uh, people are like notorious liars. You know, they, what? I did not break my hip. Oh. You know, it's kind of like, that was mean. I'm sorry. I take that one back. Strike that from the camera, please. There's a guy that does that, right? Uh, OK, yeah, that's enough on that.
Last couple of questions, I think. Yeah. So, uh, can you tell us what the smallest robot is, the largest robot, and the most complex robot that you think are out there today? Uh, no, but I can come up with uh, what, what I think is the right answer. So, the smallest robots, I guess uh, recently I've read in the, in the headlines about, um, where was it that they had a, a robot the size of a molecule and they actually made it locomote? Um, so they've got them down to that size, right? And uh, they're not, I don't think they're really doing many useful things right now at that size. But um, slightly bigger than that, they, they do stuff. Um, in terms of the largest robot, OK, I haven't thought about this, so I have to think about it a little bit. Um, some of, the, some of the biggest robots, like in the Field Robotics Center at Carnegie Mellon, are the crane robots, the ones that are designed to, to, to basically be a crane, you know. Uh, and and the, the biggest ones of those are the ones that are designed to work in space, you know, because there's really no space requirements or, or, and the weight requirements are a lot less uh, once you're up there. So those things are pretty huge and scary. Now, there's, uh, there, are, there are big mobile you know, there are the actual, like, the Hummers, you know, that, that go out across the, you know, the desert. And those are, those are big guys with lots of, in, lots of instruments pointed in various directions. Um, in terms of the most complex robots, I think probably locomotion, to me, feels like the most complex mechanical area for, for robotics, you know. And what's interesting about that is that a lot of that is not about looking at an object and saying, man, look at all those intricate little pieces all interacting, you know. A lot of that is, by, is uh, having a lot of forethought and looking at nature and building an, uh, a shape you know, that's actually intelligent in the first place um, that takes care of a lot of the low-level stuff on its own. And uh, if you want to read about that, Bob Fold does a lot of that stuff at UC Berkeley where they'll put a cockroach on a treadmill you know, or a crab on a treadmill and study uh, how its limbs are doing their thing and then try to, try to kind of pull out the principles so they can design an intelligent leg that doesn't require a lot of control, too much control. So that's kind of my lame answer. <laughs> Maybe the last question? Yes. So how do you guys pull everything together? If there are a bunch of robotic specialists and you guys need to put a robot together, they yeah. say, hey, let's get the sensor guy over here, the AI guy. Or... Yeah, you know, so th there's all this stuff about being interdisciplinary, but I mean, if you walk into a room and you see a robot head, you know, and it's looking at you and it's doing all the things heads are supposed to do, but it's a head. You know, and you walk into another room and there's a pair of legs. And they're just walking around, you know. And the, really, <laughs> the synthesis of all of those that I've seen have been put together, uh, you know, by Honda or by, um, by companies, you know. They're the only ones that I've seen like that are really trying to put together a, a polished, finished package of like a humanoid robot, for instance. Um, so, I mean, that's a really big challenge putting it all together. Now, I mean, that's not to say there aren't a lot of prototypes in, in universities settings that, that have done that. Um, yeah, sorry, <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> I know your book is somewhat ingested at times and it goes back and forth uh, between series. So I'll ask you a question, a serious question. Do you think at some time in the future and when would it be legitimately you could be concerned about a, a robot uprising? In other words, is it 500 years in the future? Is it 200 years? Is it five uh, years or never? In all seriousness, what Yeah, I'm, I have a really hard time answering that question. I don't know. I don't really care. I think it's too fun. Not now. <laughs> That's my answer. So, so uh, I do think that it's possible, uh, but I don't think it's going to happen any, t like, I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetimes. Um, if it does happen, I, I don't think it necessarily has to or anything. So uh, really, for this book, I never became an expert on the robot uprising. I just stole all that stuff from movies. <laughs> and that's my line on that. So. But just in case, you can buy this book over here on the, uh, the left, your left-hand side. And uh, Daniel, uh, I hope, will be sitting at his table and uh, signing a few copies for us. Thank you very much. Thanks.